I do want to introduce my good friends, uh, Nadia, uh, Rabbi Nadia Gross and Rabbi Victor Gross of uh, Deep Ecumenism Institute. And um, quite happily and coincidentally, we're uh, co-located here in Boulder County in Colorado. And um, Nadia and Victor uh, have been carrying on uh, the deep and what I think is really profound work of uh, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi uh, and had personal relationship with him and for students. And, and uh, I've had the pleasure, although my schedule has been somewhat erratic of late, but uh, uh, Victor and Nadia hold a, a monthly um, interfaith discussion group once a month. And I've had the, the honor of being asked to join that and the pleasure of occasionally being able to do so. And it's just been really, really wonderful. And I just from my perspective, this work of speaking across traditions and lineages and practices and finding common ground and finding common voice and, and sharing songs and uh, stories is just, uh, is profound. It's really profound. So uh, I will uh, mute myself here and hand it over to uh, my friends, Nadia and Victor. And uh, I believe perhaps Victor is gonna go first here. So thank yeah. you everybody for being here. Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, I kind of sense that um, this is a forum that makes it possible to talk about things that even in my own community are not always um, received with, a, with the true understanding that it requires. And I hope you'll get to see why I say this at the very beginning. I'm sure that all of us can say that we are um, perpetual students. We're always learning, either formally or informally. We learn through experience, we learn through books, we, all sorts of ways. There's a statement that's attributed to a number of people, but when I first learned this was so many years ago, I learned that it was uh, attributed to Aristotle, the philosopher. And it was said by him, supposedly, that if he is seen farther than any other person of his time, it's because he stood on the shoulders of giants. And that was always um, something that I carried with me, that not knowing how far I could see that I had a responsibility to the people whose shoulders I stood on. That was, I didn't use the term legacy at that time, way back, but now that I'm at the other end of my lifespan, I realize that legacy becomes something that I inherited and I transmitted to a degree, and I owe a certain responsibility, a certain gratitude, a certain thankfulness to the people who brought me to this point in my life, who have never departed from my life. And to the degree that I transmitted that legacy that I received to the next generation, um, that's been my challenge in life. Um, we're all teachers and we're all students. And I think about the teachers who informed me, there's so many of them in so many areas of my life. I certainly would start with the most important teachers in, in my life, certainly, and they continue to be, certainly Nadja as my partner of 49 plus years now. And um, grown children, four of them, who taught me be, to be a better human being, to find out what parenting was all about, because I had no clue. And um, so there's that realm. But there are also people who taught me more than just 
the exterior material that I carry in my life, the knowledge that I have. And th these people have a significance that has carried on for her as long as I had encountered them. So one example is that when I was a junior or senior in high school, my rabbi introduced me to the teachings of um, Abraham Joshua Heschel. And specifically his book on the Hebrew prophets. And it was at the very beginning of the civil rights struggle in the United States. It was soon to be the opposition to the war in Vietnam. And so the message that the Hebrew prophets, as seen through the eyes of Abraham Joshua Heschel, became a cornerstone of my, not only my outlook, but my activities, my engagement in opposition, in protest, in concern. It was only years later when I was studying to be a rabbi and went to the institution that Abraham Joshua Heschel taught at, that I became a physical presence in his life and he became a physical presence in my life. And that changed the whole dynamics. It allowed me to engage with him of questions beyond what he wrote in books, beyond the speeches that he gave, right? And it was at a time when he represented the Jewish people of the world at Vatican II. And the result of that was that the Catholic Church, which had rubbed up against, and this is a moderate word, had rub, rubbed up against the Jewish people for 1,700 years, causing distress, causing loss of life, and they never met together. And yet Vatican II provided an opportunity to restart, reboot the non-relationship to a relationship. And he was the primary um, mediator of this for the Jewish people. And so I was, for the first time, in contact with something that was opposite to the teachings that I had received. You know, it was a matter of particularism, of, of moving inward and staying away from the outward manifestation of Christianity, All right? So engagement with him was dramatic. But there was little for me to do with that. Just the profundity of his challenge to me studying to be a rabbi at that time, to go beyond the insularity, to be, be the particularism of being a Jew and forgetting about everything else. Then comes in the 90s, uh, our engagement with Reb Zalman Shafter Shalomi and our moving to Boulder in 2000 where he lived and the ability to engage with him about all his teachings. But as you'll hear in 1998, he gave a teaching uh, in upstate New York that Nadja and I were present at, which changed our lives. So one of the things that, that informs me about legacy is what is it that I have learned that I can transmit that is transformative. Transformative on a personal level and transformative on a group level. And it was the teaching um, entitled Deep Ecumenism that Reb Zalman gave in 1998 that changed our lives. So very briefly, this is what the person who coined the term Deep Ecumenism, which Sometimes is the term that's used now is interspirituality, but deep ecumenism was coined by the theologian, originally a Catholic priest, now an Episcopal priest, um, Matthew Fox. Um, and this is what he said in a book called One River, Many Wells. He says, what is deep ecumenism? I begin with an observation.
from Meister Eckhart, who was a Christian mystic, who says, quote, divinity is an underground river that no one can stop and no one can dam up. Then Matt goes on to say, there's one underground river, but there are many wells into that river, an African well, a Taoist well, a Buddhist well, a Jewish well, a Muslim well, a goddess well, a Christian well, and an aboriginal well. Many wells, but one river. To go down a well is to practice a tradition, but we would make a grave mistake if we confuse the well itself with the flowing waters of the underground river. Many wells, one river. That's deep ecumenism. The purpose of this book is an effort to get us into the wells and hopefully deeper into their source. The conclusion I got was to move out of the particularism, to move out of the area that I had previous occupied and move into the spiritual traditions that informed the other wells and also fructified the river. And it was also the teaching that Reb Zalman gave is that all spiritual traditions today are weak and they need strengthening and they need to get their vitamins from other sources as well as their own uh, well. And so that's what I've been engaged in uh, since particularly 2003. And I'll stop at this point and turn it over to Nadia. Thank you. And I'm just delighted to see so many friends here today. So I want to welcome everyone and um, those, uh, those who we know particularly. It's wonderful to see you with us. So my very first teacher was my grandmother, who was herself a mystic and who transmitted to me an oral tradition that came through her mother line. And then I later encountered um, a young, fiery, boundary crossing rabbi who I married and learned from him um, a great deal about my tradition, but my origins were in a universal mysticism. So I always had the both and in my life. That very particular well, which is our well, but I had swum in that river from a very young age. And when I first came, to, so I grew up in Israel. When I first came to the United States, I couldn't find that fervor, that love of divinity, of that presence that we call God, for lack of a better term, just an umbrella term for all those things that we do and do not believe in. Um, I couldn't find that in the Jewish practice of the congregations that I uh, was familiar with, but I did find it in a charismatic Christian church, in a Buddhist temple where I went to study Japanese at the age of 13 because all my friends went to Hebrew school and I didn't need to go to Hebrew school. So I went to Japanese school. And I found these resonances of the things that I had known from a very young age from my grandmother. As I grew to love more and more my particular well as well. So in 1998, when we sat in this four day encounter with Reb Zalman, where he taught about deep ecumenism, and his practice and his encounters 
with the Dalai Lama, with Thomas Merton, with Thomas Keating, with, with indigenous leaders. And, and this was a teaching to 80 rabbis. And he was asking us, begging us really, to embrace this work most of whom were having a really hard time embracing it, particularly with the C word, with Christianity, um, but with, and with all, with so many other traditions, I felt freed. I felt like now I could tell the truth about my own life experience because Reb Zalman gave us that permission. And it was at that teaching, while Reb Zalman had been our teacher for some years already, and I'd been learning a lot from him, but it was that week that he became the teacher in my heart, right? That I really took him into my heart and felt like this was something that I wanted to take forward. And Victor and I both, as he's already said, really felt that our lives were transformed in that week. Each of us coming from different experiences, but really feeling. These were our marching orders. This was our Rebbe telling us what, what we could be and should be, even though I don't like the word should generally, as renewal rabbis, as rabbis in his lineage. So we fast forward to the year 2003. We are now in Colorado and a new congregation forms and asks us to be their rabbis. This congregation is formed of mostly multi-faith families. We had previously served a different congregation and those were the families that found us most, that we were most open and, and, and made it possible for them to be part of our community without, um, without apology and without requiring that the Jewish partner was the alpha or that Judaism was the alpha religion. So they formed the congregation that we still serve. It's called Pardes Levavot. It means Orchard of Hearts. And we needed to find a home. We started out meeting in people's living rooms. And we had learned from Reb Zalman that new congregation, new synagogues forming should not build their own building or rent their own space. They should look to a church to share space with. His feeling was, you know, the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians should share a sacred space because we worship on different days of the week. And in many of these buildings, outside of the day of worship, the buildings are pretty empty or not used very well. So we started looking for a, a church that would allow us to rent space from them. And we came upon Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church, ELCA in Boulder, Colorado. And the welcome that we received was, we're not looking to rent, we're looking for partners in spirit. That was an amazing invitation. And we called Reb Zalman and he became the mentor to Victor and myself and the two pastors who were also a married couple at that time at Shepherd of the Hills, pastors Linda and Larry Daniels Block who are still till this day amongst our closest friends. And though they've left Boulder and they and Linda serves a church in St. Louis while Larry is blissfully retired, um, we, we co-lead an interfaith pilgrimage to Israel and Palestine every other year with them. And we stay very, very connected. Um, and I will just add that the present pastor of the church is also very much uh, a, a dear friend and her husband is a pastor as well, serving elsewhere, but they've become very close friends and have totally embraced deep ecumenism. So Reb Zalman came in with us to this relationship and shared with us his experiences. But really, you know, we called, we called this talk the gifts and the burdens of legacy, right? He, he handed that legacy to us and he said, you do it the way it works for you, the four of you. He was present at the first 
time that we attempted to worship together as two communities. He was present when we when, when we um, established the church building as also a synagogue and put a mezuzah up on the door. Um, he was present for many other encounters, but he really left it to us to do it our way. And what we discovered was that we started by choosing a day of the week that the four of us, the pastors and Victor and myself, would come together and learn together. And we would take turns bringing a sacred text to learn. So uh, our own sacred text that we would then teach and learn together. What we discovered was that we learned so much more about the other's worldview and their and and their way that they that they encounter the world and faith by learning a text together than if we just sat and asked questions. Well, what do you believe about? What do you and Reb Zalman even taught in deep ecumenism? Don't start with dogma or with theology. That's where we get stuck, you know. He said, start by asking. How do you get it on with God? So we did that by learning together, by praying together, by not being afraid of one another's language, by learning to allow. Pastor Linda is an amazing prayer, and I learned so much from her, from watching her pray from her heart, because Jewishly, we pray from a prayer book. We have formulaic prayer. And even though we're told that we should talk to God in our heart, we, we rarely do. So we learn so much from them. And what they got from us was the ground from which their faith grew. And that's what we experienced today with pastors Janet and Phil as well. I'll just add one more thing, and that is that in this relationship where we first started out as two small faith communities could make a much bigger impact on the needs of a community than each of us alone. They were already doing amazing social justice work and work for, for the poor and, and, and the hungry. We have right now in the parking lot of our Sina Church of God, we call it, um, a little free pantry sort of based on the ideas of the little free um, libraries that people were putting up in their yards. We put up a bigger box and it's open and we keep food in there, staples that will keep, and people can come and people in the community know it's there. During COVID when so many of our neighbors lost their jobs or were furloughed or whatever, and people of generally who were used to living on their own now had need to be able to come and just withdraw pasta and canned soups and things like that and dried dried beans and what have you and not have to ask to give them their agency. That was a beautiful thing that we were able to do together and we continue to keep it supplied. So, but we knew that we could start out that way and then we start, then we brought the learning to the community so that our members and their members have become friends to one another. We have a member in our congregation who is a tree surgeon, and he provided the Christmas tree that stands on the, you know, near, near the altar space um, for a number of years because he had a client that was cutting down those trees from their property. He would bring it and, and gift it to the church. And so many of those kinds of things that have gone back and forth. Because by learning together, by studying books together, by doing good works together, by feeding hungry children together, these relationships developed. And out of that permission, permission to ask questions, to be curious about what the other believes, how their lives are led by their faith. And so that we've gotten to a place where there are no, there, there are no questions that can't be asked as long as they come from a place of personal curiosity. There's no desire to make one another something other than what we are already. And, um, and in fact, Pastor Linda at one point said that in this relationship, the Lutherans have become more profoundly Lutheran and the Jews have become more profoundly Jewish because 
in teaching one another and in, in being examples to one another, we get more deeply rooted in who we are. And that's the beauty of deep ecumenism. At the same time that we, we learn from each other and we take vitamins from the other. So just as I said, I learned a form of prayer from Pastor Linda that I'd never done before out loud that I now can do in community with, without, without being embarrassed or feeling like I don't know what I'm doing. And, um, and there's so many more examples like that. But I'm going to stop here and hand it back to Victor for a few minutes. And then we're going to open it to your questions and your curiosities. No, you have to unmute first. When I said at the beginning that I intimated that this isn't always popular, the, the reality is, in, 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 for the most part, in the religious slash spiritual world, at least in the United States, there is a turning inward, a protection of the property that they assumed in reality. And there is a fear of dilution if they engage with the other. When I first became a congregational rabbi in the early 80s, the community that, that hired me said, we want you to engage in interfaith activities. So the first thing I discovered was is that there was an interfaith council in the small city. So I went at the first meeting and there was a prayer offered at the beginning over the food and then the clergy engaged in trashing the boards of their individual churches, synagogues, etc. That was it. And I returned many times and that was still it. And I had no idea what it was that we were supposed to do. And in many cases, 50 years ago, what happened was in, in a town was is that the rabbi went and preached at, the, at a church one Friday night and the pastor preached at the synagogue and that was it, that was it. And there is still an understanding that in the end of days, somebody is going to be triumphant over everybody else. And they'll be able to say, we were right and you were wrong, but we don't have to wait until the end of days because we believe this all along, all right? And where is the safe space in their own realm that they protect? The protection is amazing. The one other thing that I want to bring up, because it was something that was discussed originally when we were talking about this uh, day, and that is, how do you choose a teacher? You know, I started out by saying there are hundreds and hundreds of teachers that have influenced my life, All right? But how do you choose one? Well, there's a Hasidic story that um, two people are on a train to go uh, see this great mystical teacher. And one of them says, oh, so you're going to uh, with me to study mysticism and the, and the uh, hidden books. And the guy says, no, no, that's not why I'm going. I'm going to see how this mystical teacher ties his shoes. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second is, I reserve the right to be an independent contractor, okay? That implies a certain degree of freedom to not have to buy into everything my teacher taught. You know, this is part of my Western secular education more than my spiritual education because my spiritual religious education had an expectation of following certain things that came out of the mouths of the teachers. So somewhere around 2000, 2001, when we had moved to Boulder, Reb Zalman handed me a book. It was in Hebrew, 
had that aroma of a very old book, which I love that smell. And you hold it in a certain way of respect and honor to that book. And it was the teachings of a particular 18th century Hasidic rabbi. Solomon never told me what the purpose of handing me the book was, other than I assumed I was supposed to study it, which I did. And I went back to him and handed the book back after several weeks. And he said, so what did you learn from it? And I said, not an awful lot. The te teachings in the book were not particularly uh, special, unique. They were in accordance with other teachers of that time. He said, okay, what did you learn from the book? I said, I learned more by knowing this teacher's biography. He says, what about it? He said, well, he was a student of the founder of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov, but he was also a colleague. And he said, so? And I said, that defines our relationship. I am your student, but I'm also your colleague. And from then on, there was never an effort to cajole me, to get me to go along. It was a mutual examination of positions held, faith expressed, some beliefs, but not a lot, okay? That's crucial because there are so many people in so many spiritual traditions, in fact, I would say every spiritual tradition, that enslaves people to a teacher. And I don't know of any religion that can say not ours, all right? And it scares me to see it because it's kind of like what we've experienced in the political realm, all right? That devotion to the leader, all right? We saw it throughout history and the cost is too high. And so in choosing a teacher, the first thing when we met Reb Zalman, we knew of his outstanding place in the world of, of, of world religions, not just of Judaism. My interest and Nadja's interest was how he tied his shoes. And when we were convinced that this was a person who acknowledged his own frailties, his own oopses in life, that we could be what we were becoming with him. And, and once that was clear, and that there was a collegiality and a student-teacher relationship that could mingle and never get tested, that it flourished. And, and we are the beneficiaries of it. And other people say, hey, he enjoyed his relationship with us, all right? And so um, it, it, it's part of our effort in our organization, Yerusha, to deal with Yerusha means legacy. How you transmit legacy in the legitimate way of acknowledging that our teachers who have shown us ways to go also expect us not to buy into every word and freeze dry it. That it is supposed to be watered and tended to expand with our own efforts. So that's, that's my uh, <laughs> rampage. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Nadi and Victor. Wonderful, wonderful. And I hope we've uh, stimulated some questions and some thinking. And uh, um, we have plenty of time here, and we're a small enough group um, that I, I think this can be quite interactive. So I hope everyone feels safe and supported. Um, and feel free. If you have a, a comment or a question or something to share on the topic, um, you can. I can see everybody because we are a small enough group. 
and Jacqueline's demonstrating here how to, how to raise your actual hand. Um, it, uh, and I'll call on you in a second, Jacqueline. Uh, if you'd prefer to raise your uh, your uh, electronic hand down under reactions, you can see you can see raise hand. So I'll watch for those. But Jacqueline, in the meantime, why don't you go ahead? Thank you so much. Um, I was very moved by what you had to say and and what you're doing there in Boulder. It's it's really um, something that I have kind of longed for and haven't yet found in my own community. And um, so I, I was uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your, um, if you still take the trip to Israel and if it's just with the Lutheran community or if there's other, um, other people represented, um, if you could just talk a little bit more about that, uh, that'd be great. Sure. Um, we are actually planning the next trip in October of 2023. And we're about to launch the um, registration for that trip. It'll be 10 days on the ground. Um, we started this as an interfaith spiritual pilgrimage uh, for um, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, those for whom that land has some holy connotation. Um, it's very hard to find Muslim leaders who have a who have a connection with the land and who are permitted in the land. So we tend to um, uh, connect with leaders who are there locally when we're there. And we've taken with us, I mean, it's a, it, the trip is open to anyone who wants to come along. So while it's two rabbis and two Lutheran pastors who are leading the, the, the group, um, we we also of course engage with with Islam while in Israel and um, and Palestine of course and um, and we welcome you know folks from all backgrounds who are interested in experiencing this land from a spiritual perspective. We um, while it's true that everything is political, we tend to to. To, to not be uh, overtly political in, in this trip, except to the extent that we call it Israel-Palestine. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a little bit obvious where we land and the places that we choose to visit, but we're really there to have a spiritual experience of this ancient land with the resonances of so many feet that have walked that land um, in, in alignment with their divine uh, guide and guidance. Nadia, um, if people are interested in participating uh, uh, next fall, uh, is, there, um, is there a way for them to stay in touch with you that you could possibly share? Yeah, well, I will put the um, link to our website right now in the chat. Uh, which is undergoing some major overhauls. So it's it leaves something to be desired. But on the website, you can actually, at the bottom of the, the, head, the homepage, you can ask to be put on our email list, and then you'll receive the emails. And of course, once we have the trip um, uh, publicized, I, I'm sure we'll find a way that ZPI will also um, promote you know, let you know, we'll, we're in conversation about how we promote things for one another, and you'll be able to hear it through them as well. But this is um, the, uh, the website is Yerusha.org. Yerusha, the Hebrew word that means legacy. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, anyone else, please, if you... Uh... Anything that comes to mind? Jeffrey's applauding. Oh. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> I, 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 Jeffrey, I'm not sure if you intend that to be raising your hand or if you're applauding. Oh, uh, yeah, both. Good. Well, go ahead then. Yeah, I have uh, two uh, uh, like comments and, and one kind of a question. 
And hello, rabbis. Nice to see you again. Hi, Jeff. Yeah, I have two. Uh, my first comment is, you know, like for me, when I was very young, I was introduced to spirituality, uh, like from a Christian guy. And then I also got into Eastern religions a little bit. So for me, and I know for a lot of other Jewish people that, and I think a lot of people like in the 60s and 70s were getting into Eastern religions and then said, hey, I can find that in my own religion. But uh, that didn't turn me off from other, that never turned me off from other religions because I saw that, hey, what I'm seeing in these other religions or in Eastern religions, it's in Judaism too. And I know, so I think that that happens a lot with a lot of Jewish people, especially from the 60s and 70s. But my other comment and question is, you know, in the world today, you know, you have like the Iranian government, uh, the Islamic, that doesn't uh, uh, tolerate any deviance. Or you have in this country politicians that say white nationalism and the government should be taking their orders from the church. And I know like, and this is kind of my question, like in Orthodox rabbis, uh, where they say that um, when you look at another religion, it's a vota zera, which is the worship of idols. How do we, my other com comment and question is, how do we, uh, how do we uh, communicate with like our Orthodox rabbis and stuff that believe that you know, talking about other religions is a vote of zero. So those those are my comments and questions. Yeah. So my response is an first an acknowledgement that we all have to make that every spiritual tradition contains intolerance historically. All right. And any attempt to deny it is just an ostrich's head in the sand. The reason why we work so hard in what we call deep ecumenism is that it is the antithesis to intolerance. It is the engagement, it is the dialogue with the other that for too many years has been one of denial or refusal to engage. And so what one of the things that Yerusha is doing with the Deep Ecumenism Institute is that we are beginning to train people to in, be Deep Ecumenism activists, advocates, practitioners. It's not an intellectual exercise. It is an engagement in the world, all right? It requires to go beyond the comfort zone at times, all right? It's the ability to avoid, well, the difference between your is and my ought, or my ought and your is, all right? It's not to deprecate the other, it is to enjoy the commonalities, the shared commonalities of, of spiritual traditions, and then to honor the differences, all right? We're not in the business of developing a hybrid religion that will satisfy everybody. The fact is, is that every religion, spiritual tradition brings to the table the ability to recharge the spiritual batteries of the world, all right? And to work together rather than apart in facing the common problems, the climate change, the whole issue of this planet is a spiritual challenge. It's not just a practical challenge. It is a spiritual challenge. Why? Because the Western religions taught that we humans have dominion over creation. All right. And where do we learn that it's not the case anymore from Eastern traditions? They never bought that totally, the notion of control. All right. They were far more at one with creation. 
And so when we borrow the vitamins of other traditions to infuse the energy to save this planet and to save all of creation, we earn, uh, Heschel had this great thing that he said once, he said, what is, what is the result of all our striving in this world? And he said, to evoke an eternal amen. I find that beautiful. That's all I want to do is through my efforts that when it's over on this plane, that someone will say <laughs> amen to my presence. All right? And um, so, uh, it, 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 I mean, Jeff, I, I'm not engaged in trying to convince people who are so hardened in their outlook to dismiss the other. There's more than enough of those people. And I would rather engage with people who are open. All right. And hope that at a certain point, the bile that rises up in those people filled with the antagonism towards the other will eventually suggest to them they might find a different approach. And give them my address. <laughs> That's the best I can do, Jeff. Uh, thanks, for Fred. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Nadia, do you want to add to that, or are we, are we okay? There? No, I see Martine's hand up. I'd love to hear her question. Good, thank you, Martine. Um, well, I am just taken aback. It's going to take me a while to process everything you said. I feel like what what I'm hearing is something I've looked for my whole life. So I'm kind of shaking inside. It's wonderful. Um, I grew up in a Baptist church, and my minister was a very liberal Baptist preacher, and there was a synagogue across the street, and they would do the switching. They would teach each other's congregations. So we had a really wonderful, I had a wonderful childhood with that. Um, and I think what really struck me um, is what Nadia said at one point, um, learning and studying together, doing good works together, and asking questions of each other is, brings that energy, which um, Rabbi Victor said, too. Um, I went to another Zen Peacemakers interfaith discussion a few weeks, a month ago, with um, Mike Holler and Jesuit priest, and he said the same thing, and, that, and I wrote down that note that um, in Zen, in Buddhism, words are... Um, you can't get <laughs> too far using just words and concepts, you know, and that actually doing things together really um, is where this energy, this juice comes from. And I was very impressed with that. And you said it too. Um, I, I wrote down a lot of notes because um, uh, <laughs> there's a lot here and I really um, appreciate you coming to speak. I, I can't even think right now what my questions are, but um, um, something about joining together with different faiths in person versus words and just talking about it. I've never really heard that. And now I'm hearing it from you all and you did it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I, you know, Martina, I want to say that um, one of the things that we brought to Reb Zalman when we were first inspired by his teachings was, you know, you've done it on the global scale, like you've met with the Dalai Lama and movies and books are written about it, you made, you know, and you've met with Tom, you, so you gave us the inspiration, but it has to be brought to the average, you know, Jew in the pew, you know, right, or, right, so, and he said, that's your job. And then we found our opportunity in 2003, which so it was something that we had been thinking about for some time, because it's not going to result one of Rev Zalman's oft repeated phrases that everybody quotes is the only way to get it together is together. Right. Well, you have to get together with the people who are, you know, who, who are living in this world and 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 making these relationships happen. And so we've been delighted 
to have that opportunity. Um, we, and yes, it's it's in the relationships. I mean, everybody knows, you know, how many families, you know, uh, have have changed their tune about all kinds of things, whether it's gender issues or intermarriage or whatever, when it happens in their family. And now they, they realize, oh, but I love this person, even though I never thought I could love a gay person or, uh, you know, a, 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 a non-Catholic or whatever it is that, you know, I love this person. So now I can't hate all of their people, right? That's how it often happens. And the the relationships that have formed now remember we've been there since 2003 it it took a while to ramp it up to get it to get beyond the um the suspicion and the superstition um we discovered a few years into our presence there that the ark that we had in the sanctuary that contains the torah scroll right the sacred our sacred book we had it built on wheels so that we could push it to the back of the sanctuary um, after our service. And, you know, it wasn't in their way. And and we would take the cross that was on the pulpit, near the pulpit, that was a movable cross, and we'd move it behind in the sacristy dur during our services. Well, we no longer do any of that. We discovered that they were curious about what was in that box, in that ark. And so we had a service together where we opened the ark, we took the Torah out, and I chanted from the Torah with all these Lutherans standing around so that they could see it wasn't some mysterious object, it was something accessible. And we invited them to come forward and be up close and personal, which would not happen in some more traditional synagogues, right? Certain people aren't supposed to approach the Torah, not in our world, right? And um, and at a certain point, it was a member of the church who said, why does the ark have to live in the back of the sanctuary? Can't we put it right up in front, right? And then we realized that a few times we forgot to move the, the cross before our service began and nobody mentioned it. So we thought, why do that anymore? So now both congregations pray with a cross and an ark with the Torah in front of them. We, we, use use the Torah, they don't, that's fine. They have reference to the cross, we don't, that's fine, but they're present and nobody's triggered any longer. Nobody has issues with that any longer. And I'll say one other thing that was so delightful for me, just before COVID this happened, I was in a grocery store and bumped into one of the members of the church, one of the, you know, very active members who'd been in our book groups and whatever. And her mother was visiting. And she and she called me over. She said, Mom, I want you to meet our rabbi. Right. And so that was like this was a Lutheran referring to me as their rabbi, right? And the, the same would be with Victor if he had been present, right? It, we, we have this relationship and our members refer to Pastor Janet today as, you know, our pastor. She's our pastor. Um, and nobody's changing their religion or their, or their worldview or, the, or their faith, but we are embracing the all because we're getting it together together. Well, let me mention one other thing that is very, very um, personal for me. I'm a trained historian. And so as part of my um, research, was a long-term study of the Holocaust and the ever-presence of anti-Semitism. So it creates a, um, a button that can be pushed. Okay? So about a week or so before Thanksgiving, we have a very irregular, informal gathering of a number of the churches in our geographic area where our church of synagogue is located. These are, uh, and for several years we have met, and then when uh, the uh, coronavirus, we met on Zoom, but it was an irregular 
But all these ministers are committed to social activism, are very progressive, both in their uh, theology and in their politics. So every year we do a joint Thanksgiving service the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. So we met, and before we got to the topic, we're just exchanging, catching up what's going on. And one of the ministers said to Nadia and me and to the group, but it was pointed to us, I'm deeply disturbed by the increase in anti-Semitic activities and actions and incidents in this country and around the world. Now, my historical background kicked in. And I said, this is unique. Because in the dark days of the 30s and 40s, there were very few non-Jewish responses to the ongoing Holocaust. My answer to him was, I'm not so concerned. And he looked surprised. Right? I said, I'm more concerned about the aftermath because anti-Semitism is the canary in the mine shaft, All right? And so that encounter in that few moments was brotherhood, sisterhood coming together, all right? And, and that, and just as so many other issues that compels religionists, not just clergy, religionists, people who have faith to engage in protection of those who are vulnerable, recognizing that it's not just them, but it's also us at stake. That's a huge change. It's huge. And it has to be worked and massaged and expanded so that the results will be an overcoming of this emergence in this country, that it's okay to hate, it's okay to discriminate, all right? Victor, I saw um, Stacy's hand up. Oh, but now it looks like. Yeah, I, oh. um, I, need, I need to leave, hold on a second. Um. <laughs> I have another meeting um, that I have to be at. Um, I just, all I wanted to say was in regard to the brave work that I say that we, this is, is, is what you've been talking to already. Um, but I wanna say that it takes people doing that work within the communities and speaking about it within the communities that they're in to be able to open the door for others to be willing to even explore that possibility because it's, it's difficult, um, especially for Jewish people more so, I think, than Christian people because Christians share the Hebrew scriptures as well as the, the New Testament scriptures. So, um, what I have found is that that there then becomes this curiosity. It's like um, if 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 we do the work, but don't speak about the work in the communities that we're engaged in, then um, it's like we're undercover, so to speak. And I think it's really really important. And it that's why I say it's brave work because sometimes it's, it meets with the resistance that's already been spoken about, um, but it's still important to speak it. And I'm sorry, I have another meeting I have to be at. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. You know, I, I, I wanna just um, say that that's, that's what we in Yerusha, in our organization, so this is beyond our congregation, Victor and I, 
formed in 2017, this organization, Yerusha, and um, to carry the legacies forward of our teachers, Reb Zalman, chief amongst them, also my grandmother and other teachers that, that we've named and not yet named. Um, and, uh, and, and we see it as um, the, the, the ground from which all of our programs grow is deep ecumenism. Right? So we are not, while, while we're founded by two rabbis, we're not, a, or actually four, <laughs> there, there were others, el elders with us when we first founded this organization who are now retired, but we, um, we don't call ourselves a Jewish organization. We call ourselves a faith-based organization and we are committed to deep ecumenism and our programs our, our programs, our educational programs at the intersection of education, spirituality, community, and justice. And we, we seek, you know, participants. So the Deep Ecumenism Institute, which is one of our projects in Yerusha, is going, is developing a two-year training program for seminarians and spiritual leaders in different um, religious communities who want to learn how to do this. And yes, speak about it. And I will just add to what Stacy just said. We even here in in our town, when we started and continue to do what we do with Shepherd of the Hills and Pardes Levavot, there are um, both you know synagogue communities and Christian communities that kind of look at us like out there and you know out there like what are they up to? What are they with with a lot of um, not curiosity, but suspicion, right? What kind of hybrid religion are they trying to create there? Or, or whatever thoughts that, 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 that we've heard articulated, you know, to us and about us. Um, and you just, you just got to keep doing it. Because as Victor said, that's what's good. If anything's going to save this planet, it's going to be people of faith coming together to save the planet. It's not going to happen. And yet the politicians have already proven to us that they're not about to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really it's really up to people of faith who love this world, who love the creation that the creator gave to us and 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 want to see it survive. Yeah, I, I wanted to add something in recognition of the group we're with. And that is, um, when Reb Zalman retired from um, Naropa, um, he asked me to take on his teaching. And I said, he, he was occupying, he was the first occupant of the World Wisdom Chair at Naropa. And I said, I'll be happy to take over your teaching, but I am not an applicant for the World Wisdom Chair. I'm not there yet. Anyway, what, it was in the religion department, and some of you may know, and I know Jeff knows him, Fleet Mall um, was, you know, one of the dominant, still is, um, members of, of the religion department. So he welcomed me at the first meeting of the faculty, and he said, ah, the non-Jewish spokesperson, I mean, the non-Buddhist spokesperson here. And I said, well, not exactly, because I wouldn't feel comfortable here if I hadn't been somewhat of a product of the teachings that you offer. And he said, like what? I said, how about silence? How about um, just being able to experience moments of solitude and quiet and to meditate in a deep way. He said, where'd you get all that from? I said, from Reb Zalman, <laughs> right? Because he learned it from his engagement with Buddhist teachers. So it, that's, you know, it's, it, it's, what does it feed, all right? If I'm part of one of the wells, I, I imagine that the wells leak, all right? If the river leaks into the wells, how about horizontally as well as vertically? 
and the vitamins that I needed. Jews are loquacious people. All right. And the, and and I'll get I'll conclude with an example from another tradition that I'm more and more acquainted with, and that is Native American uh, spiritual practices. So I had learned, uh, uh, you know, um, the to- the talking stick, the circle, the whole thing, right? And I loved it because my first experiences many years ago was with the Native Americans practicing this. Then I, Nadja and I served a, uh, a spiritual community in Berkeley and they used that. But the difference was with the Native American, when the person is holding the talking stick and finishes, he or she gets up and places it back in the circle and then goes back to where he or she is sitting. All that time, there is a silence as they incorporate what was said. Well, in this spiritual Jewish community, they thought they had mastered this art. And as soon as somebody finished with the talking stick, somebody said, here, and they passed it over. And there was no absorption of what was said. All right. So it gave me an opportunity to teach that the spirit, if you're going to borrow, borrow authentically from a spiritual tradition and authenticate it by acknowledgement. That's the key, all right? So that's just one example. And um, Fleet Mall will always enjoy the fact that when they started the faculty meetings, we started um, with a meditation, um, in silence, whatever, and he always enjoyed seeing that I enjoyed it and needed it too. So that's how you work it, all right? Thanks, Victor. And this sounds this sounds a lot what you just described, like uh, Zen Peacemakers Council practice, which of course we borrowed too from uh, Ojai Foundation and probably from the Iroquois before that. So. Uh, yep. uh, um, Mary Rita, you've got your hand up. If you want to go ahead and unmute, please. Thank you. I will. Yes. So one of the things that you didn't talk about, Rev. Victor or Nadja, is about the about how important learning that the people that will be part of the institute are going to have um, to learn how to listen differently and to learn how to dialogue. Because so often we can have the silence even after you're finished talking. But if, well, I know before I, I, I've been trained as an Imago relationship therapist and I learned how to, in a sense, get out of my own world to be able to be seen and listening through the heart and through the heart of the other person. And that means that I have to have, in a sense, a, I have to have a receiving heart soul mind to be able to do that and so often um it's so easy to fall into i'm I'm figuring out my answer on what i'm going to say or i'm going to be looking through my own heart rather than the person that i am sharing with so i i wanted to 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 share that i've been working with another woman that i met through deep ecumenism work Lucky Lynch, who has done over 30 years of interfaith in, interfaith dialogue. And um, we are working together on a course that we are planning to teach in the Deep Ecumenism Institute to really help people listen, wholly listen in this connecting uh, that that we call deep ecumenism. So it's it's also taking from other sources and I, I loved hearing your example uh, and I, I am drawn to Native American. I just don't know, I, it's another area that I need to cross the bridge. We talk about crossing the bridge and walking around the neighborhood of the other person. So I wanted to share that too. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Mary Rita. Thank I wanted, you, Mary Rita. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to pick up one of the questions in, in, in the uh, um, chat. Uh, from Batya, because it's most intriguing. That is, um, 
how can the talking stick procedure be used for online meetings? What a great question, because I, you know, we've gone from the physical presence where there's a different type of, if you will, control of where you can set rules, all right? To, you know, we've been on Zoom for over two years. When we finally get to meet, I am amazed that people have a lower half body. <laughs> Never seen in all this time, you know? But the fact is, is that more and more, as I see the speed, the Evelyn Wood conversation, speed talking that goes on, especially on Zoom, that we need to, you know, I don't, can I hold this up? When I hold this up, everybody please be quiet. <laughs> Those are the rules at the beginning, all right? Or to teach people that there is no gift received when you immediately respond to another's offering. There just isn't. The brain doesn't work that quickly. All right. So if everybody just takes a moment after everyone speaks, even though we don't, you know, this is a poor substitute for the talking stick, um, you can do it. And it should be done. All right. And, you know, the older you get, the more time it takes to absorb and to sort it out. So you, you engage in that moment of, of, of turning inward to appreciate what was said. All right. <clears throat> and the last thing about this is in conversation. One of the things I learned from the Native American tradition of these types of, uh, of conversations is, is that for the most part, the next speaker builds upon what was said. It's not independent off somewhere else. And so if you ask people to build on what is said, it re shows respect for what preceded. All right. And and that goes back to the thing I started, you know, way back when I said, if I've seen farther than any other person, quoting Aristotle, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Well, acknowledge that the person that preceded you is one of those giants. It changes the whole conversation. It's part of the dialogical principle that Mary Rita was talking about. It, it, it doesn't work if there's no respect. And how you demonstrate respect is by acknowledging the other's contribution before you offer it. Because too often it sounds like it's a, um, in, that it's contrary to what was previously said rather than building and building and building okay if i could uh thank you victor if i could add to that too but um and and this is not a, a solicitation or an advertisement for zen peacemakers but uh as part of our core practices in zen peacemakers we do this all the time pretty much uh every week we offer a council practice uh, either a general that's open to everyone. We have a women's council once a month, I think, mental health workers council, and um, and it's on Zoom. Um, it needs to be, and it was before COVID because our membership, we have 7,000 members in 40 countries. So it, it's impossible to be together. So we've gotten very good at doing it virtually. And, um, and I won't take up too much airspace here, but... Uh, if anybody's interested, reach out to me. Um, uh, and, it, and it really is because we approach it, not mechanically, but ritually. It really is a collective contemplative practice. It's not a discussion group. It's not a conversation. It's not a debate. It's not storytelling hour. Um, it's something much, much, much deeper than that. And uh, 
you know, may, maybe another time we can have a chance to talk about it. But but it can work very well virtually, and and it really is the result of everyone agreeing to, you know, some guidelines. So we have a uh, we have uh, about ten minutes left. If anyone has another comment or a question, I can see your regular hand, or I can see your electronic hand, and and if not, I I have one in my pocket. <laughs> The pocket it is, it looks like. Um, uh, Victor, I, I, uh, when you were talking, uh, if I could, uh, I and Nadia, both of you, I, lo I loved so many things that you've said. And uh, Victor, you talked about uh, uh, avoiding kind of the doctrinaire or the or the the rigid uh, words becoming a freeze dried. I think is what you said, which I really loved. Um, in, in, in some of our rituals, we, we have an expression uh, after, after a talk is given, uh, admonishing everyone not to believe a word I said. And there isn't enough water in the Boulder Reservoir to wash my words out of your ears. <laughs> so that <laughs> reminded me of that. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, you refer to legacy, and in our, our, in our Zen practice, lineage is a big thing. Um, and we study you know, the teachers from, uh, you know, the past. And in fact, in, in, in some of our services, uh, we recite uh, the names going back 2,500 years. It's about 85 lineages. My teacher is the 85th in a lineage. I, I wanted to ask you it, to, you know, forgive the language, compare and contrast legacy and lineage. Are they the same thing? Are they different? I'd say they're different, um, but there's an interconnection with them, all right? Um, our receiving ordination from uh, Reb Zalman put us in a lineage because he received ordination. He's in a lineage called the Chabad lineage, which was a branch of Hasidic spiritual uh, Judaism starting in the 18th century and 1700. And there was a transmission through, unbroken. And so it's kind of a um, sometimes pleasant, sometimes onerous burden to bear that lineage. Okay. Um, you don't have to abide by everything that went through in that lineage, but you honor that lineage, all right? Um, the legacy is in the seminary, the Jewish Renewal Seminary, which was an outgrowth of Reb Zalman's work, um, I taught from the very beginning with a colleague, and then when he retired by myself, um, Reb Zalman's work for transformation. And the first question I asked, and he was still alive at the time, was what is enduring? All right. And what is transitory? And it's kind of a, almost hubris to make that decision, but it's important if you're going to transmit, all right, that legacy to determine that. And one of the things I'm absolutely convinced is that deep ecumenism, which he gave over to us, is enduring because after I pass away, it doesn't mean that I help solve the problem of getting along with other spiritual traditions. It's an ongoing effort and it will be as long as there are spiritual traditions around. His there are other aspects of his work that are enduring, all right? And so in any lineage, in, 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 in the lineage that you were talking about, Jeff, there is stuff that's worthwhile transmitting, and there are other stuff that you may not choose to transmit. It's a huge amount of material, all right? Um, so sifting through it and 
constantly engaging with it and seeing it in new light and moving it forward, all right? Zalman never had the idea that we should train people to be practitioners of deep ecumenism and what it would constitute, what's the curriculum look like, but we're doing it, all right? And when the when we started this just months ago, formally announcing of the Deep Ecumenism Institute, I sent the announcement to Matthew Fox. And Matt sent back an email to me and said, Reb Zalman will be most pleased with you guys. All right. So that's the carrying on of it. All right. And so it works in every tradition with every great teacher. You know, the Buddha is still teaching us, not just Buddhist, but he's teaching all of us. The universal teachings are there. It's the same with every tradition. Jesus, te- you know, this is heresy. Jesus teaches me. Okay? Always teaching me. All right? So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you couple minutes here. Anyone else have a, a question, a, a brief question or comment? Does not look so. Um, Stephen, you uh, you chatted a, a question about uh, a recording. We are recording and uh, because we are, we're a tiny but mighty team, <laughs> it, it takes us a few days to cook the video and then run it up through through YouTube and put it on our website. But you will see the recording from this session at zenpeacemakers.org probably, Chloe, probably next week. Or you're, you're muted, Chloe. But, uh, yes, in about a week. About a week, yeah. So Stephen, and I'll you, send you, the link to that in the follow-up email today. Oh, good, good. Well, uh, we want to, we want to, uh, be mindful of the time, and uh, I, I'd like to close and thank uh, Rabbi Nadia and Rabbi Victor for sharing their wisdom and their experience and their heart and their insight and their inspiration. And I heard people being inspired, and that's what that's what we want to be doing here. <laughs> so I feel like it was a, a, a morning well spent. So thank you both. Thank you, everyone, for spending your time with us today. And uh, we hope to see you again at another event. And everyone stay safe. And uh, Victor and Nadia, any any final words uh, from you before we close? Well, I, I just want to express my appreciation to you, Jeff, for this invitation and Chloe for all the work that you did behind the scenes to bring us to this moment. <clears throat> and um, and really bless us all to go out there and be audacious. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I just will say what I hear at the end of our Lutheran services on Sunday. Go forth. Go forth. And serve the divine with peace and love. Yes. Right.